Good morning, everyone. I'm Nathan Shapura, political advisor at the European People's Party. And on behalf of the EPP, welcome to another episode of EPP Family Talks. Over the past several weeks, we've had the pleasure of speaking with leaders from throughout our political family about the ideas and projects they've been working on. Today, it is our great pleasure to welcome Mr. Pavlo Klimkin, former foreign minister of Ukraine, and Dr. Niko Popescu, former foreign minister of Moldova, for a special focus on the Eastern Partnership Summit and the Eastern Partnership Policy of the European Union. Ministers, thanks so much for being with us this morning. I would start off, uh, I hope you both can hear me, uh, I would start off with a question for both of you, a simple question, and that is simply, with the seventh Eastern Partnership Summit this week, what should we expect? So maybe I'll start off with Mr. Klimkin, for first to you. I think, I think you need to unmute your microphone. It should be fine, yeah? It's uh, it's too, basically too many different uh, software stuff, and uh, you, <clears throat> you need to manage it. <clears throat> we live in a kind of different reality, and it's good. And uh, I very much hope that the Eastern Partnership could uh, live uh, in a quite different reality. And for me, this reality is about a uh, simple uh, sense uh, of... Uh, of what uh, the Eastern Partnership uh, should achieve in the future. Now, uh, Eastern Partnership for me is a bit more than scaffolding, but a bit less than framework uh, to play a bit with, uh, with English here. So uh, the geographical coverage is okay, but uh, to have uh, the internal, intrinsic, I would say, integrity in such a geographical coverage uh, is, uh, is quite a challenge. So uh, to get strategic about the Eastern Partnership, uh, it would not be the result uh, tomorrow, but it what I actually would uh, so much wish uh, from uh, all kinds of strategic minds, not only in Brussels, but also throughout uh, the European Union, to get strategic and to understand uh, where, where we've been hidden to. So there is a focus on strategy there. Dr. Popescu, how would you answer the same question? What should we expect this week? I'm, in a sense, I think the Eastern Partnership has had a lot of achievements in the last 10 years. Now Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia have uh, deep free trade areas with the European Union, visa-free regimes with the European Union, the energy security of our country is stronger, not least thanks to cooperation with the European Union and European help. But if I look at the 10, decade, uh, the 10 years ahead for the Eastern Partnership, I think the main priorities should be the exact same priorities that the Commission of Ursula von der Leyen. We are hearing a lot of talk about the need for a more geopolitical Europe, for a more strategic Europe, for a Europe that behaves like a power. And of course, we have the Green Deal um, agenda. So I think if I look at the next 10 years ahead, it's very important to get up to speed in the Eastern Partnership both on boosting environmental cooperation, but also on boosting security cooperation. Because if we are talking about a geopolitical Europe, it is quite obvious that you cannot have a geopolitical Europe if Europe doesn't behave geopolitically and strategically in on its own continent, continent vis-a-vis the Eastern partners and by strengthening security cooperation with Eastern partners. I definitely want to follow up with both of you on the, on the security question, but maybe first uh, a little bit of a broader geopolitical question, following up on some of the things both of you have touched on, and that is as foreign ministers, both of you have much supported the Eastern Partnership Plus formula, which would give more possibilities for Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine. EPP has very much supported its trio, uh, the, the associated trio. We, we did this in a resolution in Zagreb at our Congress in November but there's not always very much support in Brussels for this idea, because it seems some people think this might kill the Eastern Partnership project and these advanced forms of cooperation could happen maybe better simply at a bilateral level. How do you see this? Uh, how do you see the situation? Maybe first to you, Dr. Popescu, and then Mr. Lincoln. 
I'm not very worried. All policy frameworks have countries with different levels of engagement. Inside the European Union, you have countries inside and outside the Eurozone. You have countries inside and outside the Schengen Zone. In the Balkans, Croatia already joined the EU and other Balkans countries are on track to the EU. In the southern neighborhood, the quality of relations between the EU and Syria compared to the quality of relations with Tunisia are very different. So, in this sense, it is natural that the Eastern partners are different. They have different levels of ambition and expectation and closeness to the European Union. And it's good for the European Union to uh, develop relations with all the Eastern partners. But of course, it has to differentiate. It has to move much faster and engage much deeper in institutional and economic and political and diplomatic cooperation with the countries that are closest to the EU, closest to European values. And here, of course, I obviously refer to Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia. And Mr. Klitsin, the same, the same question to you on the Eastern Partnership Plus or the TRIO. Uh, look, for me, for me, it's a simple one. I believe uh, that the whole idea about splitting uh, in free in free is the wrong one. I believe we, we need a creative and consistent approach to the Eastern Partnership. And why uh, actually not to have uh, countries which could do more, actually could do more together. And at the same time, why actually forget about, uh, about the others? Because we have uh, interesting formats uh, within the Eastern Partnership like Guam, where we can engage Azerbaijan. We can't forget about Belarus, and it's a lot of uh, interesting, uh, not exactly funny, but interesting things uh, going on there. And Armenia is important. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, from the point of view in Brussels, uh, it's rather about simplicity. Let's take a kind of consistent stuff, and consistent stuff is easier to manage. But easier to manage uh, is the wrong answer now. It's as simple as that. Very interesting. Um, so the next question I want to ask you is something you also both touched on, I think, in your earlier remarks, and that is about security in terms of the Eastern Partnership. You're both, you've been working on a security compact. Some countries, for example, France, have been less enthusiastic about this because they see Russia as an important piece of the security art architecture for Europe, so that excluding, excluding Russia would not be a good idea on, on that view. What do you think about this? And do you think this is realistic that member states would support a security compact for the Eastern Partnership. Now, first, looking to you. Uh, look, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I've been following different ideas in Paris, uh, and I don't see a kind of consistent view towards Russia there. If you talk about President Macron, it's probably one point. But still, uh, I would uh, advise our French friends uh, to get their minds out of the out of the mentality, which is not exist. Uh, it's, it's not there anymore. The idea about, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's say it kind of uh, simple way, zones of influence and Russia and all kind of stuff and any reincarnation of Yalta is fundamentally over. Firstly, because it does not work in the, in the present reality. And secondly, because uh, simply it's all going uh, more and more hybrid. More hybrid zones of influence is not about uh, taking Russia, you know, simply into, into the equation. It's simply about uh, strengthening our security and our capabilities together with the European Union. And it's not just for us, it's also for the European Union for me, quite existential issue. And the better this understanding gets uh, in Brussels, uh, the better would be our security in the future. Dr. Popescu, what would you say on the same question about security? I would say that, you know, to a large extent, I think we are all on the same page. France wants a strong Europe, Ukraine, Moldova, Germany, Sweden, we all want a strong Europe a Europe that is listened to, a Europe that is influential. If I look around Europe, I see that the voice of the European Union is not very well heard 
on crises such as Libya, such as Syria. We have now the European Union being somewhat sidelined in this uh, Serbia-Kosovo dynamic and conversations. And this is not something I would necessarily want to see on the European continent. We need a strong European voice. The second thing we need, and if we are talking about a European security architecture, for a stable architecture, we need strong neighbors of the European Union, a strong functional Ukraine, a strong functional Moldova, with strong security institutions, with strong intelligence services, with strong economies. So on this, I don't see really uh, that there are big differences from French or German or Swedish priorities. The main question is how do we go about it? And one thing that, and there is all of this conversation, how do you engage with Eastern partners? Will this irritate Russia? Now, you cannot have a stable relationship with Russia if Moldova and Ukraine are weak, because this will and can be a source of tensions and tensions and even worse, and no one needs that. So the only route to a more stable European security architecture is to have stable and strong countries between Russia and the European Union, and that will have a stabilizing effect on everyone. And for that, we need Europe to be geopolitically relevant. We need Europe to be influential. We need Europe to have a strong voice on security developments in Eastern Europe. And we need to make sure that Europe is not as weak in Eastern Europe as it is today in the Middle East. I want to follow up with you, Dr. Popescu, on something you've just talked about, which is the need for strong neighbors, for example, and including a strong Moldova. You were foreign minister in the most pro-European government Moldova has ever had under Prime Minister Maya Sandu. How do you see things now under President Dodon? Do you think Moldova is moving more sort of along a pro-European track or more along, a, for example, a pro-Russian track? Fortunately, Moldova is stuck. It's not moving anywhere. Uh, Moldova's, the, the relations between Moldova, the current Moldovan government in the, and the European Union are in a deep crisis. Moldova is failing to fulfill several European conditionalities. Moldova is hard hit by the COVID crisis. It's one of the most affected countries in the region. It's much worse than in Ukraine, worse than in Romania, worse than in parts of the Balkans, if you look at per capita terms. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we have seen the fact that the current government cannot even extract and manage good relations even with Russia. They are pro-Russian in their statements. They are good at sending, you know, soldiers to parade uh, in in Moscow at the next military parade at the par military parade next week. But the current government is not even able to have a good working relationship with Moscow. Moldova is paying today more for Russian gas than Germany does. Moldova still does not have open access for its exports on the Russian market. Uh, so, in this sense, that is a government that unfortunately is not moving anywhere in terms of having an efficient foreign policy that serves the interests of the country and its citizens. Maybe just one more follow-up for you about Moldova in particular, and that is, I think elections are coming up in November. What do you think your chances, Ms. Sandu's chances are to return to power now in Moldova? Maya Sandu's chances are very strong and very good. Uh, the cover current government, as I said, mishandled to an amazing degree both the coronavirus crisis, the economic situation, and the foreign policy situation of the country is in a state of near collapse. And there is growing dissatisfaction with uh, this performance. There are major corruption cases being exposed. So I think the chances for uh, a governmental, well, not a government, but of, for, for the change in the presidential, in the holder of the presidency are very high. Having said that, we should remember that Moldova is a parliamentary republic, so the, the real course of the country is determined by the parliament rather than the president. Thank you for the update and for that explanation. I have a couple of questions for Mr. Klimkin. And I, I want to ask you about Ukraine, but first I would also ask you not necessarily just about Ukraine, but about Belarus. Do you think they're looking at what's happening now in Belarus? And you spoke about some of the the, the, the very sad things, the very difficult things that are happening there. Do you see any, any chances that something in Belarus might happen similar to what we've seen 
in in Ukraine in terms of in, in terms of political change? Well, uh, I do I do see such uh, chances, although still uh, quite faint ones. I, I I'm a big fan, as you probably know, of engaging Belarus and getting Belarus back to the European family. Belarusians uh, deserve it. And one of the key points, uh, at least for me, <laughs> of the Eastern Partnership should be such engagement, uh, engaging Belarus, engaging Belarusians, uh, which is not exactly the same uh, the same point. Uh, and uh, I clearly understand that uh, Russia would also play uh, its game around Belarus. It's critical uh, in the sense of uh, Russia basically projecting or not projecting power on the on the Central and Eastern Europe. It's a fundamental point for uh, for for Russia and for how actually it's going to play out in the future. So uh, I'm uh, I'm in close contact with uh, many of my Belarusian friends and basically giving them advice, giving them assistance in the sense of uh, transforming the country, really transforming the country in a clearly, you know, European uh, and and democratic country. And if you like, it's uh, it's one of uh, it's one of my ambitions there. But uh, for the months to come, before the presidential elections, uh, I do see a very difficult pattern for, for Belarus. I want to pick up on the note of transformation that you just mentioned and moving out to Ukraine, which has been a great deal of political transformation in recent years. Um, when Mr. Zelensky became president, one of his first priorities was to end the war and return the occupied territories. What is your state? How would you explain the state of play now in Ukraine? Do you think Ukraine is closer to solving the conflict? Uh, well, uh, the simple answer is no. Uh, mainly because uh, because of the Russian position, and for Russia, that Donbas does not matter at all. What matters for Russia is uh, is Ukraine itself. Uh, Donbass is just uh, a tool for uh, controlling uh, and uh, impacting Ukraine and actually Europe and the European Union because uh, Russia has been waging a war not just against uh, Ukraine but also against Europe, fundamentally trying to weaken up uh, the sense and the substance of the, the, of, of, of the democratic institutions there. So. Uh, uh, how I see the mood now in Moscow, uh, they are not interested in any way on uh, sorting out the uh, situation around Donbass. They are interested uh, in raising the stakes further, especially now, uh, you know, during this summer and during this fall. And the idea would be to try to raise the stakes uh, and uh, to bargain further with uh, with the rest, especially with the U.S. after the presidential elections, uh, but also with the European Union. And here, the sense of internal solidarity within the European Union and transatlantic solidarity between the U.S. and Canada and uh, the European Union is key. Because uh, the only way how you can talk to Putin, how you talk to this Russia, is from the point of strength. And solidarity is exactly the strength. And the second point why I believe uh, the progress is not there is a total lack of strategy here, uh, the total lack of political will uh, or fundamental lack of political will because uh, everything around Donbass, uh, you know, uh, what matters uh, is, uh, is, is very difficult in the sense of public position and uh, it's all very controversial, it's, well, it's all very sensitive. And the third point is, uh, is polarization within the Ukrainian society. 
uh, it probably uh, it's going to be controversial what I'm going to say, but uh, what we should do around Donbas is not about uh, simple uh, understanding of democracy. It's about consensus uh, in, uh, in in the whole uh, Ukrainian society, because it how we can uh, ensure that Russia not uh, not is not going to use uh, the current uh, the current situation. So fundamentally, I don't see any, I mean, uh, really, and I say it, uh, I, I see it quite unfortunately, any prospect of, uh, of real uh, positive uh, drive for change uh, in, the, in the future. We're going to follow up with both of you. And you just, Mr. Klimkin, you just stressed Russia's intentions, for example, in Donbass. So I want to ask both of you how you see domestically the situation politically in Russia. Mr. Putin, it seems, is very, very clearly trying to allow for himself to stay in power until 2035. Do you think the Russian people will accept this? How do you see the, the pending referendum? Maybe starting, starting with you, Mr. Klimka, and then Dr. Popescu, and I'll have another question from one of our viewers on Moldova specifically. But first, Mr. Klimka, on the domestic developments in Russia. Uh, well, uh, well, I believe uh, that uh, uh, Russia has been closing the end of the first uh, first reincarnation of Putin models, which uh, could be called uh, okay, a bit simplistic uh, hybrid autocracy. So uh, the future constitutional changes. Uh, are not just about uh, reincarnation of Putin, <laughs> uh, but it's it's about uh, different reincarnation uh, of uh, of the Putin's model. Russia in the future would look like differently from uh, from uh, from the one uh, we have uh, in front of us, and I don't believe uh, it's it's going to get. Uh, in a, in a, let's let's say it in a better direction. But now the problems and challenges in Russia are piling up. We see, you know, uh, oil and gas prices, uh, corruption, the ineffectiveness of this model, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, stance uh, of people towards uh, power structure, and uh, it's a total... Uh, not total probably, but a real loss of trust uh, among the Russians. Uh, it's uh, a kind of different way of understanding uh, relations between region and Moscow. So it's really a lot going on in the sense of uh, in the sense of necessity, also for Putin and for uh, for uh, for people around him, because uh, there is kind of uh, you know. Putin is a Russian president, but there is also collective Putin. And for me, one collective Putin is, so to say, Russian elite and the Russian bureaucratic uh, reality. And the second one is uh, is about Russian, uh, is about the Russians. And simply to change uh, this perception amongst Russians would, would be difficult. But I definitely expect uh, Putin and his entourage to play his game. To play his game, of course, not just uh, internally, because there are no simple uh, and popular, you know, solutions to the problem uh, to the problems uh, Russia Russia is facing. So there could be also escalations uh, and uh, tricks uh, on foreign policy track, and we should be vigilant and we should be prepared, definitely. Thank you so much for that analysis. I, the idea of a collective Putin is something I've never heard before and, and very interesting. Dr. Popescu, how would you answer the same question? What do you, how do you see things developing now internally in Russia? Partly supporting public analysis, I would, if I look back at the last 10 years, and I remember that at the previous, during the previous economic crisis, Russia didn't simply sustain, it even increased its military spending. So I think besides, you know, the current issues in Russian domestic politics, and they are very complicated, both on coronavirus and on the economy, I think several trends are likely to persist. The trend that Russia will continue uh, keeping a very strong 
I am investing quite a lot in its security and military capabilities. That's an absolute priority. The trend that the militarization of Russian foreign policy is also likely to continue. Uh, they have few other tools of power that actually work. So uh, if I look ahead, I think the situation between Russia and the rest of Europe will remain tense. Um, and, you know, it's not just a matter of Vladimir Putin personally, it's the collective Putin, as Pavlo put it. There is a strong elite consensus behind such a hostile approach to, to Europe and to the United States. At the same time, I would also like to draw your attention to the case of our two countries, Ukraine and Moldova, which are actually not seeing Russia being more influential than Russia was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, even if Russia is active, even if Russia has been militarizing its foreign policy, it's still possible to withstand such pressures. It's still possible to consolidate relations with uh, the EU and the US, and it's still possible to consolidate our uh, financial, economic, diplomatic viability as countries. So Russia is, of course, uh, a powerful country, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, countries which are uh, smaller on the map of the world cannot do a lot to consolidate their independence uh, and resilience in the face of Russian pressures. So a note of optimism maybe uh, we should be aware of as well. I want to ask, ask you to follow up, uh, Dr. Popescu, a question from one of our viewers, Victor, or a comment rather. He says Moldova should move as quickly as possible on EU accession. Would you be able to respond to Victor? That's absolutely something that I've dedicated my life uh, to. I think Moldova has done uh, reasonably well overall, if you look at the region. Moldova today is highly integrated into the European economy. You know, some 70% of Moldovan trade is with the European Union, and that's thanks to the association uh, agreement. But Moldova needs to do a lot of catching up politically on the anti-corruption front, and when it does that, I hope we can have a serious conversation about Moldova being uh, in the European Union. But before we can have a serious conversation, it's important to start getting our act together as a country, fighting corruption, and Moldova is now the, one of the most corrupt countries in Europe. We need to overcome that, and without that, we cannot credibly talk about Moldova really rejoining the Euro European family of nations. Thank you both so much for, for your analyses and for your perspectives. I want to ask you both a more informal question as we finish the interview, but before we get to that, maybe one final serious question, and that is just simply, do you have any final thoughts, any final words to sum up the discussion we've had, to sum up your expectations for the Eastern Partnership Summit and the Eastern Partnership Policy uh, going forward? Just any closing remarks for, from each of you. First, uh, first, Mr. Klimkin, and then Dr. Popescu. Uh, look Firstly, it's, uh, it's great to have this chat with Nico, with you, and uh, I believe it should be kind of uh, pushing people uh, around Europe uh, to uh, rethink uh, the stance uh, towards uh, the Central and Eastern uh, Europe in the most strategic and what is really important, bold way, because uh, uh, the, the security and safety of uh, everybody in Europe uh, is now uh, redefined, I believe, uh, because of this crisis and will be further redefined. And, and we need a kind of uh, real brainstorm. I mean, both politically and non-politically, in the sense of understanding how we, uh, we are ready and uh, we are capable uh, to go forward. And uh, simply to, uh, to pretend uh, it's a kind of uh, business as usual uh, within the Eastern Partnership. For me, and I hope this chat with Nico uh, gonna help us to understand, uh, is, uh, is, is not an option. So uh, you, uh, you first asked about uh, how we see the result of the summit. Uh, I believe it should be a kind of uh, great push on uh, on uh, on such a brainstorm and uh, <clears throat> of course uh, I, uh, I i hope also nico could participate and uh, it should be about uh, real understanding what we can do here. So i i noticed in your earlier remarks 
uh, or I, I focused on the idea of strategy, which you mentioned. And then here, uh, the phrase that caught my attention was not business as usual. This is really a serious and urgent moment. Uh, Dr. Popescu, your final thoughts. Perhaps I would develop it a little bit this idea of a European security architecture. I think we need it, but what is architecture? Architecture is not a drawing on a paper. It's real building. You know, it's built in stone through scaffolding and or a metal frame. And if we are looking into the future, we do need a European security architecture. But this architecture cannot be some new papers signed. Whatever papers will be signed, you know, new Helsinki, old Helsinki, it doesn't matter. This architecture will not survive if you don't have a strong building in place. And this strong building means two things. One is strong state institutions in countries like Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, strong security institutions, which will be able to sustain this architecture. And the second thing we need is a strong European Union voice on security matters. The whole world is watching and, you know, China and Brazil and Sub-Saharan Africa and Saudi Arabia will never take Europe seriously if Europe is not a serious security player on its own continent, in the Balkans, in Ukraine, in Moldova. And so far, I think the European Union has sometimes found it easier to be ambitious elsewhere than it's on its own continent. And that is undermining European influence overall and globally. And that is why I do believe it's very important for the European Union not to be afraid to deal with security matters in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, in Moldova, in Georgia and throughout the region. And that will be the best recipe for a stable European security architecture in the future. So what I took away from that was, if, if you'll allow me the liberty of saying we need not a house of cards, but a house that's really solid and sturdily built in terms of security and a strong EU voice on this issue. I want to say to both of you, thank you so much. This is the first time actually that we've done one of these EPP family talks with, with two guests at the same time. And it's a very important, serious, timely, urgent issue. And so I, I thank you both um, for, for all the, the, the ideas and perspectives you've shared with us. I think it's gone very well and been very helpful uh, to all of our audience um, and to all of those concerned with this important policy. And I wanna ask both of you a, a less serious question to finish, which is a question we've been asking so many of our leaders and we've been getting a lot of great feedback. And that is simply, you have a book or a film or a series which each of you might recommend for our viewers. So first, uh, Dr. Popescu, let's start with you. And one old and one new book. So the old book is called The Sphinx and the Commissar. It's published in the 70s uh, by Mohamed Heikal, who was Nasser's propaganda minister. And it traces the rise and fall of Soviet influence in the Middle East. That's a very interesting uh, book with a lot of astute observations about uh, both the nature of power, uh, the Middle East itself. And the second book I'd like to recommend is a book I recently read. Uh, it's called Sandworm written by Andy Greenberg, and it's about uh, a Russian advanced persistent threat group, meaning state-supported hackers, who have been attacking physical uh, critical infrastructure uh, across the world, including in Ukraine, probably in Moldova. So it's a book about Russian hackers, uh, and I'd like to draw your attention, and I'm sure Pavlo had to deal with this, but while I was in the ministry, we had major cybersecurity issues. We were under constant attack, uh, it was important for us to withstand these attacks, uh, but in this game we are all together, Ukraine, Moldova, the European Union, because the moment uh, a war, a virus attacks the Ukrainian uh, physical infrastructure, it very quickly spreads into the rest of the world. So on this I think we're partners, and with this I'd like to stress also the need for Europe and its partners, Eastern partners, to work much more together on boosting cybersecurity because that's something also Europe needs. Very timely issue indeed. So, Mr. Klimkin, your recommendations? <clears throat> well, uh, I'm gonna give you uh, one, uh, one pretty serious uh, and another one, uh, well, a bit funny probably, yeah? Uh, thinking about, uh, or, <laughs> or probably rethinking European future, I would love everybody to read uh, 
books uh, by Tony Judd, very famous uh, historian, uh, not just the one uh, written uh, together with uh, Timothy Snyder, but uh, he's probably one of the most nuanced, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say even uh, performer on, uh, on European ideas. His understanding on European ideas and European perceptions uh, is probably, you know, among uh, top five for me. And another one, probably more funny in the sense of, uh, especially over the corona cri crisis, uh, I would uh, really recommend everybody <coughs> to read again uh, the famous uh, Ulysse by, by Joyce. You will find a lot in the sense of, uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, forward thinking about uh, Europe and the future. Well, I personally, uh, those, those recommendations resonate very much personally with me. Post-war is one of my favorite history books by Tony Judd, along with others by, by Tony Judd and Timothy Snyder both. And you said Ulysses. Did you say Ulysses by Joyce? And uh, it, it could sound like a bit of fun, but uh, read it again. Over corona, over corona crisis, you will find a lot uh, to, think, uh, to think over. I think it was Time or, or the New York Times or one of the big magazines listed uh, Ulysses as the greatest English, no English language novel of the 20th century. So uh, it's a difficult one, though, but indeed one maybe with some comedic um, some comedic undertones. So Mr. Pav Mr. Pavlo Klimkin, former minister, former foreign minister of Ukraine and Dr. Niko Popescu, former foreign minister of Moldova. Thank you both so much for being with us today to focus our attention, especially on the Eastern Partnership Summit and the Eastern Partnership Policy. Thank you both so much for the work you have done and are doing. To all of our viewers, thanks for joining us. You can follow on our social media channels, the conclusions of our EPP uh, Eastern Partnership Leaders Meeting which is later this evening, uh, and have a great day to both of you. Thank you very much, Nathan, and thanks to the European People's Party for being, being this driving force of a more powerful Europe. We all need it. Please continue what we're doing and always count on us. Thanks. Thanks to you both so much again. To all of our viewers, join us again next time for our next episode of EPP Family Talks. Tomorrow we will be speaking with Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Republic of Slovenia, Mr. Anshe Logar, on Instagram at 2 o'clock Central European time. Have a great day and see you then.